as you can see, I've modified my title a little bit to show that some of these thoughts may be new and some may not be new. And basically, there are more, much more questions than thoughts. So basically, what I'm going to do is criticize everything we've been doing in terms of measuring wisdom. And then, yeah, we'll see what's, what remains left. Actually, some, a few nice ideas will still remain. And some of them have been proposed by Igor. So I think he will like this talk. <laughs> anyway. Um, so I'd like to not define wisdom for this particular talk, but to um, propose something like a very general pseudo definition, which basically says, I hope we all can agree that wisdom is some kind of interactive combination of, on the one hand, cognitive capacity, such as having broad and deep knowledge about life, and having some kind of cognitive complexity that allows you to deal with complex issues, but also, on the other hand, having important non-cognitive aspects, such as reflectivity, as Monica has proposed, or compassion, some things that I believe belong, in belong to wisdom and are interactively related and inseparable from the cognitive aspects. Which makes this whole thing a bit complicated already. One reason I think we can remain largely definition-free, I would just like to show you briefly, and I've showed this before at other conferences, these are basically data where we rated um, transcripts of interviews about a difficult personal conflict um, according to different models of wisdom, which is basically Monica's model, the Berlin wisdom model, the Bremen wisdom model, and our more life experience theory. Um, and what you can see here is that basically pretty much independent of how you rate those, um, those um, transcripts, it will all be the same. So what this seems to be showing is that even though our measures tend to be not particularly highly correlated, when you actually look at the same data and, tra and, and use different concepts to code them, you get much higher agreement. So basically, we may all be looking at the same thing after all. And it may not really matter that much how exactly we do it. So this is the reason why I believe we don't have to have a definition for this particular talk. But the, the, the point is, if this is a cognitive plus non-cognitive thing, how can we best measure such a complicated thing? And as you all know, there is this, two, th this classical um, distinction of the two <coughs> approaches. One is self-report measures, such as Monica's. The other is performance measures, such as the Berlin paradigm or the work Igor has been mostly doing. Um, there have also been some attempts at, cl at closed response formats, where you have like a problem and a number of possible solutions, and people are supposed to, s to select the wisest solution. But it turns out most people can select the wisest solution, if even if they couldn't come up with it in an open format. So I guess that's why mm -hmm. closed response formats, unfortunately, don't really work. So. Um, here is um, one example of a self-report measure. This is the already mentioned brief, brief, brief wisdom screening scale, which we just constructed by taking items from three different scales, uh, selecting those that were most highly correlated with a common factor of these three scales. Um, and this is just to show you what such items can look like and to show you some possible issues with these kinds of items. And the main point that I would like to make is that some aspects of these uh, of wisdom are more more open to introspection and more easily to judge in a valid way by introspection than others. For example, um, I'm able to integrate the different aspects of my life. OK, I think I can, I can reasonably answer this in a relatively correct way, which is also true for sometimes I get so charged up emotionally that I'm unable to consider our ways of dealing with my problems. This is also something that I can, yeah, OK, actually, this happened last week, so I'm probably, it's probably true for me. But then when you look at things like, it seems I have a talent for reading other people's emotions. I might think I have this kind of talent, but I might be totally off and other people are just not telling me. You know? <laughs> so this is A, about other people, and B, it's about a competency. right? So it might be much, uh, as we all know, people are notoriously bad at judging their own competencies. So I think, especially when it comes to competencies, <laughs> self-report may just not be the way to go. Whereas other aspects of wisdom, and I'd like to make this point, because we tend to somehow discard self-report to a large degree. I, some, I think some things are actually much more easily easy to measure by self-report than by going coding terribly complicated response transcripts. Anyway, so um, the great advantage, obviously, of self-report measures is that they are easy to administer, easy to score, quick, and everything. I believe they are really good for measuring those aspects that are open to introspection. The problems, there are a number of problems, obviously. One of them is I wouldn't want to select the CEO based on their score in any wisdom scale because they might be able to fake it. Mm -hmm. um, one aspect is that generally um, people aren't necessarily very good at reporting things about themselves because for, uh, of reasons such as all of us having their blind spots, really not noticing some 
things we may, may not be so good at. And there's a specific problem to wisdom and to other um, constructs that have something to do with humility. A person who is really very good at, I don't know, um, judging other people's emotions may still also be aware of the degree to which sometimes they are wrong and so might not tick off the highest level of the scale. Whereas a person who just thinks, yeah, yes, I'm good at that, I'm good at everything, basically, <laughs> might easily go for, agree completely with all of these items. So when a construct involves something like humility, modesty, yeah, just, just counting the, number, the, the, the numbers of items where they have the highest level of the scale may not be the optimal strategy. And then obviously the big other question is, is it sufficient to say we measure those components of wisdom that can reliably be coded, be, be, be evaluated by self-report? which is basically the non-cognitive components, the non-competency components. Okay, these are reasons why many people have been saying, okay, let's not use those self-report scales or maybe just for a brief screening or something, let's go for performance measures. And most of you know this, this is the Berlin wisdom paradigm, a very brief description of some kind of difficult life problem and then people give their spoken answers and they are transcribed and they are rated and it takes forever and at the end you hopefully get a reliable <coughs> um, result. Igor has been using similar kinds of problems. I mean, this is just short descriptions of some problems you've been using in one of your many studies. There are many different ways he's been doing this, but basically similar, also giving descriptions of some kind of more or less personal or societal problem and asking people to give spoken or written responses to that. Um, this obviously measures cognitive competencies well when you code it the right way or rate it the right way. The question is to what degree can you get at the non-cognitive aspects of wisdom that I consider equally important things such as compassion with other people. I mean, people will sometimes say something like, you know, it really, it really breaks my heart to be thinking about those people. But at other times, it might not be breaking their heart, but they, it might still break their heart if they were there looking at those people, you know? So this is a question of to what degree are these, these tasks ecologically valid. So I'm just, I, I just think that there may be some aspects of wisdom that we may not really be getting at with those problems. As many of you know, we've been trying to kind of, yeah, <laughs> thank you. We've been trying to go some kind of middle way by asking people about a difficult autobiographic con autobiographical conflict or di difficult event, something from their own life, and ask them in retrospect, um, what was the story, how do you feel about it now, how did you feel about it then, what do you think your opponent would say, and so on. And I still believe that works nicely, but we've also found by trying this for a long time, it has its problems of its own. One problem is sometimes you may feel that this person may be a very compassionate person, but it doesn't really come out in what they're saying, and then it really gets really hard to rate it or code for it. Uh, one point is that people are talking about very different co diffi different conflicts. One person may be, may be talking about a conflict with a neighbor about where the fence should be. The other one may be talking about the divorce and it's kind of difficult to complain these kinds of things. And obviously you still have people who can give those really nice little talks about their own problems and you may feel somehow that this is a person who's not, not as wise as he or she is acting and it's really hard to get at those kinds of things. So. Obviously, we can measure competencies with open-ended um, tasks, and we may overcome some self-perception biases, but not all of them. The effort is tremendous, as all everybody knows who's ever done this kind of work. There are still biases coming from self-presentation, self and I believe some aspects of wisdom may actually be much easier to find when you look at introspection. Also, there's this big issue of verbalization. It's, it's always limited to things that people may, will make explicit in what they say. Um, plus, as we've recently learned from Igor, performance may very much depend on context, and this is one of the most terrible things I've also learned. In that study, we had two different interviews, one about a difficult event in general, one about a conflict, and we were thinking when we code both of these things, for example, for the, the three-dimensional wisdom model or the Berlin wisdom paradigm, then we should have really high correlations, because after all, this is the same person at the same time just talking about two, two different events in their lives. And as you can see, I mean, you said, you, you might say that this is still nice, nice for a personality thing, but I would like to see these correlations far higher. So even when the same person is talking about the same problem, they may have a totally different wisdom score <laughs> depending on all kinds of things, you know? So um, this means, as you said, we might, have, we might have to use at least six different interviews, maybe eight, maybe 10, which really will take us forever to do any study like that. Um, 
Yeah, so one big problem, I think, is ecological validity. Uh, a, a real life situation that requires wisdom will put you in a really difficult situation. You will be emotionally engaged, you will see no solution, it will be really difficult and hard for you. How can we and ethically, <laughs> how can we ethically bring such a situation into the lab? And the other thing that I would like to very briefly show you is that we've been running into all kinds of crazy effects recently in looking at some things in more detail. One thing being we had our interviewers rate the, um, the wisdom of uh, the per person they were going to interview after just talking to them for five minutes. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, and, and then later they also rated, uh, then they rated them again, and they also rated them for, they rated them for wisdom and for to the, the degree to which they found the person likable. Turns out this is, this is about the highest correlation I ever found empirically. <laughs> correlation between likability and wisdom rating is 0.94. Um, and it stays pretty much the same after they've interviewed them for three hours or something, which um, is worrying me for one reason particularly, and th that is because uh, an interview will influence the way the person talks about whatever they are talking about, and the more you like the person, the more wisdom you may elicit from them. Um, and another person who only read the transcripts um, still had a high correlation between likability and wisdom, but it was somewhat lower, and that person's correlation to the to the interviewed person's Berlin Wisdom score was way higher. So reading transcripts may be somewhat more valid, but my main worry with this is really that the interviewers are going to influence the interview <laughs> and the wisdom score of the person. So this is something we're only just getting into, another number of problems. Um, I've also learned, that, but I'm going to skip this, that it's very important to train your raters carefully. Um, only if you do that, they will not be totally dependent on the number of words in the transcript. Um, and then I wanted to measure that, uh, to mention that there are some new approaches that I think might really be promising, such as <coughs> Igor's new idea of basically having people think, think get really get back, mentally back into some kind of conflict or other difficult experience, and then answer some self-report questions about that. And I've tried it out to myself. It makes a big difference whether I think about a concrete experience or whether I just generally judge myself. Ute Kunzmann has this really nice task where she uses videos of real couples discussing real conflicts, which also mi might increase ecological validity by bringing people into a kind of real situation. Nick has been doing really uh, fantastic work coding things, coding our interviews for reflectivity to a degree of reliability that I never achieved with any of our ratings, so I think there's much leeway in that, in that respect too. So basically, um, I would like to argue that we may need some kind of smart combination of performance and self-report to measure wisdom optimally. We should think about ecological validity. We th should think much more about interview and rater effects. And my next, the next thing I'd really like to do would be to go beyond verbal measures and really start observing people in some kind of real life lab situation, really looking at how do they deal with a real person seeking advice or something like that. Okay, thank you very much. So I really enjoyed your talk. Um, so I had a question about you know the challenges with measurement for the non-cognitive uh, dimensions of wisdom, and I agree with you that for you know I'm not a, you know I'm not m as much of a down on self-report measures as some other people, but I do think for certain constructs they're the best way to get in at the construct. And I'm wondering for certain dimensions of the Moore model, for example, and with the understanding that there are unique challenges with them. Maybe used in informant reports might be, might be helpful. Th thinking about yeah. what type of informants yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. you look into predi the predictability, right? And another thing, and this is something I've been thinking about more as well, is to look at uh, meta perceptions, right? Instead of asking people <laughs> about their report, ask them to think about what other people would say about them, yeah. right? And there's some research showing that f for reasons that are not completely clear, it provides a cleaner report mm -hmm. Of mm -hmm. for certain traits, right? Yeah. So yeah. just yeah. suggestions. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree with that. I forgot about the informants in here. We did that one study where we had uh, people within our university, within departments, uh, um, rate themselves and their colleagues for wisdom. <laughs> and we found zero correlations between self-rating and informant rating, <laughs> and another zero correlation between both of them and the 3 DWS. So <laughs> this was one of the most confusing things I did. But I agree that maybe informants are actually even the best way, I think, to, to get to its wisdom. I just want to add to this. I'm, I'm not so sure about the informants either because they also have a certain, you know, like you have yourself an image of yourself and the informants also have an image of the ones that they are supposed mm -hmm. to rate. So it, 
you know, it might not solve the problem completely. I mean, they are. They are consider. <laughs> I mean, I've been looking at this. You know, having informants rate uh, wisdom nominees, mm -hmm. and they're very okay. consistent. They are more consistent than the wisdom nominees rating themselves on mm -hmm. the objective checklist. You know, so it's like, uh, which one do I trust, yeah. right? So even that, I mean, it's, it's, it might not be a perfect solution, but one of the things when I just, and I, and I, you know, I mean, you're, you're right, there's a lot of stuff going on, you know, and, I, and it's really tricky because you have the self-reports, which of course, you know, there's a social desirability bias, and then you have kind of, you know, blind spots, and you know, you, th you, th you, th you think you're better than you are, and all these kind of things, which is, probably negatively related to your actual wisdom, you know, uh, exactly. some, <laughs> some way, the latent wisdom. But the other thing, what you also brought up, and I had this in my own experience, it's this interviewer effect. I, and a sympathetic interviewer can elicit so yeah. much yeah. more mm -hmm. than if you have an interviewer who's just going through the motions and just basically reads from the script because and, and, and uh, you know, how, how do you yeah. solve that, yeah, right? Exactly. So it's, it's tricky. I mean, it's yeah. really yeah. tricky. We've hardly done any, any work on that. I mean, even when I was in Berlin, I noticed that we had some very young student interviewers and then we had some older experienced interviewers. And the young interviewers often had a very strong effect on, on older participants, you know, because they were suddenly in the position of giving advice to this young guy and so on. Yeah. So they, to they were in a to totally different mode of, of talking about things than when they were talking to a same age person. And we should, I think we should do much more research on, on those kinds of effects. Yeah. Yeah. So as a as an experimental psychologist, I'm very <laughs> sympathetic to the notion that um, you want to look at performance measures. But I'm also a little bit concerned that to the extent that wisdom relies, perhaps relies on a kind of reflective capacity of the kind that Howard referred to in terms of Jonathan Lear's having a recognition not only of your performance, imagine you could automatically <laughs> act in what looks like a wise way, but not be able to reflect right. on it. Right. It, it may perhaps combine a knowledge of what you're doing and why you're doing it. In some sense, performance measures alone may not be able to do it, right? Yeah. We yeah. might also want to capture. I, I don't know if yeah. people's yeah. views of yeah. wisdom are that, you know, there could be some automaton that's, that's wise. I think we yeah. want to get a yeah. reflective capacity in there. So I think there's an inherent difficulty here that isn't going to yeah. be easily overcome. Yeah. I don't think you're going to be able to have just performance measures. Mm -hmm or just introspective yeah, measures. Absolutely, to that's, the that's, that that's what I think. But one of my, my m the, the major insights I've had was one, uh, once at an early time I gave a talk to uh, on my own department and I was talking about the measures that we were using and there was one guy who I think is a very good psychotherapist. And he said, you know, sometimes when I'm, when I'm in, uh, working as a therapist, we have those moments where something happens, you know, where the client really suddenly gains some kind of insert, uh, insight or something. And then I uh, obviously afterwards I think about what, what caused this insight. And very often I have no idea why I asked that particular question or anything. So mm -hmm. it's not like he was analyzing the whole situation and then coming up with something back based on a lot of explicit knowledge. It was much more an intuitive thing, mm -hmm. which means it's, it's even more difficult to yes. get at those kinds of yeah. things. Uh, well, uh, yes, I did like this talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but <laughs> It's kind of embarrassing. I, I, I was hoping for the present for you all in the sense that I would uh, do a, uh, provide a preprint before this conference of the, of the paper describing the psychometric properties uh, of the, in the state level uh, sort of instrument that is a hybrid, the, the, the one that uh, you just so generally s introduced. Um, we need probably another few weeks. Well, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I'm a perfectionist. I'm sorry. Uh, it's my first time doing a preprint where I do it even before the. Uh, I, I send it to a journal and I will put it online. And you can all critique it because it's really supposed to generate. Uh, um, so we can talk about that a bit later. Uh, about this uh, idea with reflective, uh, cognitive, and emotional. I mean, I like all those things. Of course, from cognitive science perspectives, they're kind of all about cognitions. Uh, at the role, if you define cognitions not in terms of uh, cognitive uh, process, but in terms of some kind of, I well, it, it is a cognitive process. I mean, uh, 
mm. cognitive process involved in emotion regulation, motivational process, and uh, in how you reflect on yourself. But I, I have, um, I just want a clarification. So what is the, how do you differentiate between reflection and cognition? Because for me, reflection is a cognitive process. Yeah. Uh, is it just because it's about the self? It's a self-reflection, or I, I mean, I was basically using using this dichotomy kind of heuristically to basically yeah. saying there are some things that are more like competencies, ways of thinking about things that you can be more or less able to do, and the yeah. other thing is something more like attitudinal, like some kind of a, a, a certain mode that your mode of functioning that you're in, like being able to being empathetic to others and being somewhat distanced from your own perspective. And I think there's some kind of more more emotional uh, aspect to this, which is not necessarily a competency, but more like some some kind of attitude that you that you get into. I um, see. So, um, and I believe that wisdom is really an, an integration of both of these things. And reflection, I believe, is when you are not just cognitively, but also kind of emotionally able to take the step back and really look at, okay, what's happening here? Why am I suddenly getting so emotional in this conflict with this other person? What did he just say that kind of triggered something in me? And what does he say about me and about him and whatever? Sure. And being able to do that, at least in retrospect, is what I would probably consider yeah. an integration of both of these things. So would it be right, just to follow up quickly on that and then stop, um, would it be right, I'm trying to map it on, uh, in social psychology we talk, for instance, about implicit and explicit attitudes. Would you then say that uh, this implicit attitude of uh, implicit strategy of uh, taking a step back instead of explicit metacognitive deliberation mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. it? Is that what you're talking about? I'm, I'm not sure because I would think that this is something that can become automatized. It can be more or less automatic to begin with and it become more automatized. So I would think that one reason why um, wise people age without much loss in, in their wisdom, even though p fluid intelligence declines and we know all that, is because many of the things that they do are just automatized. So it may become maybe something totally automatic and okay. implicit to just take a step back, or it may be something that you that you do intentionally and sometimes within the I same see. person. It may be different depending on the situation. So I think that's one reason why the whole thing is so damn complicated. Okay. Yeah, th thanks for again highlighting the complexity of the issue. So I just some free association that I think something that needs to happen is external validation, and uh, which is obviously difficult. However, at least indirectly it could be done. For example, a wise person is somebody who other people also consider wise. So if you can have people who know that person mm -hmm. rate on a just, right. you know, like or type yeah. scale, where w would you rate that person on wisdom? So that would be one way of doing that. Another could be well-being. Usually, wise people should be contented, so the correlation with well-being should be there. Uh, another scale. Third would be even more indirect. Could be something like age. Mm -hmm. Now, wisdom doesn't automatically increase with age, but it should exactly. not go down with age, except for the yeah. cognitive yeah. portion. Yeah. So, if there is suggestion that the non-cognitive portion is inversely related, there is something wrong, likely, yeah. right? Yeah. So, Maybe something like that, if it could be done, even in a subsample for the scale, mm -hmm. that could be useful. Yeah, I very much agree. I mean, one thing is we did, I mean, the data that I showed you were actually from a nomination study where half of the sample were nominated as wise by someone. But one thing we learned from that study is having one person consider something somebody wise that is not is definitely not sufficient. <laughs> You'd have to have multiple informants, and we haven't been able to do that yet. Um, concerning well-being, um, Nick and I just wrote a really nice book chapter, I think, about the complexity of the relationship between wisdom and well-being and the different timelines that you have to look at. Because as has been discussed today, too, we believe that wise people have must, must have been through some adversity, and so it may be only in the, in the longer time term that you see the well-being in wise people, so I'm not sure about that one. I very much agree about age. Um, I would like to see for a wisdom measure that the wisest people in their measure, at least on average, are relatively old. I haven't seen any measure yet that really delivered that. <laughs> so, uh, Because I wouldn't want to see a general correlation with age. I just would want to see that there are a few people in the upper right corner. And I, I have yet to find one that, that does that. If they improve cognitive components, I think that because that, that's going to go I don't even think the cognitive components have to go down, even, even the fluid ones, because I think thi things might get automated, you know, so I, I think it's really complicated. Thank you. <laughs>